the New York studios of AFA Today, Kevin McCullough. But if you're watching on the AFA channel, I'm not by myself. Take a look. The guy to my left, uh, only physically, not uh, spiritually or theologically or politically, uh, only, uh, <laughs> only geographically uh, to my left at this point in time is Steve Dace. And Steve, we're uh, glad to have you here. Host of the Steve Dace Show, heard on some of these AFR stations uh, each weeknight. Uh, not uh, just right there in conjunction with the Kevin McCullough Show, kind of piggyback on each other. Uh, but uh, we've also gotten to know each other a little bit over the last couple of years, and we've become friends, and we've seen God do some pretty incredible stuff. We went to Haiti not long ago mm-hmm. and met some really cool people that we're going to be telling our listeners about in the days to come. But um, let me uh, l- let me just ask you final thoughts on the Planned Parenthood thing. Every year, these statistics come out. I always call for massive phone calls to be lobbed into the uh, – the speaker's uh, office and 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 their and their congressional representatives' offices, and it seems like there's always a little bit of headway that's made. You know, people go, "Oh yeah, half billion dollars we're giving that to Planned Parenthood." They never, never defund it. There may even be a Ted Cruz or somebody that comes along and says, "Yeah, we're going to put this forward. We're going to talk about defunding it." It never gets defunded. Will it ever? I really think, and this is where you know, in a republic, it really does come down to who your leaders are, who your proxies are who your champions are. And right now, the Republican Party, I, I always break politics, Kevin, in, down into three. There's three realms of politics, three kinds of people. All of us are one of these three things. Crusaders, gangsters, or groupies. Yeah. Okay? And, and right now, the Republican Party is run by gangsters. And all the gangster cares about is, uh, is plus point one and pay me my tribute, and then I'll basically let you do whatever you want. The Democrat Party is run by crusaders. Uh, this is not the Tip O'Neill party where Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill largely had, this, had similar uh, basis of a worldview, similar generations. And the idea of redefining marriage in, in the early 1980s, would, they would, even the Democrats would have looked at you like, what you talking about, Willis, right? right? We're now not dealing with liberals now. We're dealing with a new generation. Just as, just as the, the, the emerging generation of the right that you and I represent is more confrontational, the emerging generation of the left is far more, is, is, is leftist. They're not, this isn't the right of center, left of, left of center debate. How much should government help the little guy debate we've had since the dawn of the welfare state. Right. We're now talking true Marxism, true cultural Marxism. I, I, I was talking and in New York unhidden, City. Like yes. Completely out of the open. We just elected a Bolshevik mayor of New York City. I mean, oh, an open Bolshevik is mayor of New York City. Define okay? what you mean by that. What I mean is, if you, look in, if you listen to what de Blasio was saying, they are the pretenses and premises of the Bolshevik revolution that led the Soviets into power. And there's, and there's a pattern there. I say on my show all the time, bad Republicans are always lead to even worse Democrats. George W. Bush went just beyond off the rails, trying to save his legacy, save the unpopularity of the Iraq War, signed over really the death warrant of the welfare state in the last half of his second term. Mm. And all that did was set the stage now for the Democrats to come in and say, well, that's now the new baseline for what the size of and scope of government's going to be. So guess what we're going to do when we take over? Same thing happened here in New York City. Just like in, in Soviet Russia, you had a czar. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, we had Michael Bloomberg was a czar. I control you. I, I will control how many cigarettes you smoke, how much pop you drink. I control you. Well, the czar, people don't want a czar, so they give way to a Bolshevik. And that's exactly what's happened here in New York City. The czar has been replaced by a communist. And so ultimately, what we've got to come to grips with is you cannot negotiate with this. And the people running the Republican Party, the Boehners, the Ditch McConnells, they're negotiators, cut the best deal. Obama never negotiates ever, and he never will, because he's out to prove a point of history. And, it, and, you, and you can only beat crusaders in politics, Kevin, with your own crusader. Right. You cannot beat him or his ilk with gangsters because because they'll cut the deal. They don't want to accept the fact that there's absolute good and absolute evil. If they w- if they did, they wouldn't be gangsters, right? So th- you're not you're only going to beat the left's crusaders with your own champions or crusaders. Otherwise, you're really just negotiating on their terms, and they never give anything. And we have some of those coming up in the pipeline. You see crusaders uh, on the horizon I, for. I, I think there's potential. I love Ted Cruz. My audience knows that, um, and I like a lot of what what Rand Paul has done. I don't know that I like some of the people around Rand Paul. Uh, but but I'll be very fascinated to see because I think the Republicans are going to capture the Senate this year. And if they do, it's likely going to be like 51 to 49. And so if you're really excited about Rand Paul or Ted Cruz, and they've both given you reasons to be, wait until they're in the majority. Now, this is what happened to Rick Santorum. 
People forget in the 1990s, Rick Santorum was the Ted Cruz of the 1990s. Right. The conservative grassroots loved him. He was everybody's it speaker, Everybody, every conservative group's fundraising keynote speaker. Then what happens is early 2000s, the Republicans get total control of the Senate. But this time, unlike in the 90s, they've also got a Republican president. Right. He comes in without the popular vote. He's unpopular. Then there's an unpopular. Then they want to go to war. It's very controversial about whether, whether to preemptively invade Iraq. And the pressure to be, as, as Santorum described it, the quote unquote team player becomes overwhelming, and he finds himself endorsing Arlen Specter, Christy Todd Whitman, voting for No Child Left Behind and Medicare Part D. And all of this led to him losing his Senate seat by 18 points, which, according to my research, is the worst loss any incumbent U.S. senator has ever had wow. in American history that was not involved in a scandal. Okay, And that happens because your base feels that you're going to lose anyway, so why should I show up for you? If you're going to lose anyway, I'm going to, make you, I'm going to send a message. And so I want to see what happens when Cruz and Rand Paul are in a scant majority and now it's, it, it's easy to take some of these really most principled positions when they're never going to see the light of day. But when the, when the entire culture of Washington puts the pressure on you to say, you know, this turd just isn't as stinky as the one we would, do, we would serve up, and we need you to cover our backsides, and we need you to, to be a team player, it'll be very interesting to see if they're still able to withstand the corrupt culture of Washington, D.C. And I sort of describe it this way to our audience. When you get elected to federal office nowadays, it's like when you buy a brand new car. As soon as you drive that puppy off the lot, it starts deteriorating right, in value. Right. So if I'm Rand Paul and I'm Ted Cruz, I don't wait a, a few more years to run because likely the longer you're in Washington, the worse your star is going to get. Run now while it's still hot because that the, the culture there really is it, it's almost to a point where we've just got to drain the swamp and say it's insalvageable. Well, I think there's a lot of people that feel that way. And I, I know one thing. Um, I, I don't know that I'm looking forward to young guys running, um, which kind of goes against what you were just talking about. But... Uh, we've had a, a, a series of young presidents mm-hmm. since Clinton, and um, I don't know that we've come out ahead. I, I'm, I'm almost I'm almost looking for instead of someone to be my daddy, I want somebody that's more of a, a of a sage grandfather that kind of has some wisdom in their uh, in their in their bank. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna come down to can we get the most principled guy against the least principled person from the other party, and if Hillary Clinton turns out to be that person, Steve. And we'll turn uh, topics here a little bit. This is going to get really interesting because today out of Washington, you've got a bipartisan Senate report that says Mm -hmm. the blame for Benghazi is on the Obama administration. This isn't a Republican report. This is a bipartisan report. Mm -hmm. You've probably read up on it already. What's, What's your reaction to this headline? You know, my reaction was very similar to what I saw Congressman from my home state, Steve King, tweet out uh, earlier today, which was essentially, hey, how I, we told you so. Those of you that said we were a bunch of idiots, bunch of conspiracists, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What do you have to say now? And of course, what they have to say is is basically nothing. Yeah, the New York Times come out and preemptively uh, try to uh, insulate Hillary Clinton from this about uh, a week and a half ago with a report that even a lot of moderate to liberal reporters read that report and said, this isn't journalism, man. This is it's like you're the sports Diane information. Feinstein yesterday yeah, said it, it's like you're the sports information department for the Hillary Clinton athletic department. I mean, right. That's not even this isn't even a pretense. It's like MSNBC published this. OK, so it, that when they've when, when your own industry is turning to one of the lions, the, the paragons of, of, of the history of the media and saying this even your reporting is a joke and and i think they're in an interesting position where the best thing for them would would have been to get this out of the way right away and now you almost become as you know pot committed where where what and it's always the crime it's never the crime it's always the cover-up because now we go back and and we talk about well you know she already gave some sworn testimony to the united states senate did she perjure herself did she lie uh, you know, we had a president uh, exert executive privilege over Fast and Furious. Remember that last year? Over well, and over and over But again. at the same time claimed he had, he, it wasn't a part of his uh, White House's uh, direct dealings, which then would not make it constitutionally uh, eligible for uh, executive, executive privilege. privilege. So they, they, they're trying to basically run out the clock here. And if Hillary Clinton didn't want to be president, maybe the Four Corners offense would work. They run out the clock. They do as much damage as they can do on their way out the door. They ride off in the sunset knowing that the gutless Republicans don't have the courage to roll back what they've already done to the country. But the problem is Hillary Clinton's ambitions are getting in the way, which keeps making this stuff relevant and makes it impossible for them to run out the clock clock and, and run away from. Yeah, most people that had been paying attention <clears throat> knew that there were there was uh, grave uh, 
uh, neglect in the Benghazi case. Uh, but, th- th- you know, and it's interesting that we're talking about this in this location, Steve, because this is the uh, this is uh, ground zero for Bridgegate and mm-hmm. for uh, Chris Christie's problems with uh, a traffic jam. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of polls in his state of New Jersey today. Most of the people don't believe him. They still give him a high mark for uh, accomplishment. But uh, everyone's all concerned about how it affects him in 2016. Let me just say up front. I, he's not my guy for 2016, so I, I don't really care about I that. I thought he was anyway. toast in 2016 before this even began. The day that he said that you took you took away voluntary counseling for kids that yeah. uh, have uh, s- struggles with their sexuality, uh, and that that can't be done anymore, that he lo- he lost me completely on that. Finally, after uh, giving him the benefit of the doubt on some I, things, I, I think we, you bring that up. That needs to be fleshed out more. Essentially, what Chris Christie did was sign a, a pretty good rule of thumb, ladies and gentlemen. It's not a tried and truism, but it's probably darn close. If California is the only other state that's ever done it, it's probably a bad, very bad idea. Don't become the second. Yes. And, and, and what Chris Christie signed into law basically says that if, if, if you even say to your own children who are struggling with their sexuality, if you share the gospel with them, you're guilty of a crime. Now, that's basically what it is. And, and, and for the Republican Party, which would not be where it's at, would not have ever won a national election, there would not have been a Reagan coalition without the original moral majority, the original religious right, the original values voters. It, w- it, was, it was really a waspy minority Northeast party until we came along to then turn around to us and say, oh, by the way, your new champion is a guy that just signed a bill into law that would make you a criminal for sharing the gospel to your own children. That is so beyond the pale. I just, right. And I think we probably haven't done a good enough job of, un, of letting our audiences know just why so many of us are repulsed by the very concept of him as a standard. Bearer. Oh, no. The, my, my audience is quite familiar because it wasn't just that. There's been a number of other things. But uh, like I said, he's not my guy. But if he came down to it and it was a Christie and Hillary race, you're going to compare the negligence of Benghazi to the negligence of Bridgegate, and you're going to tell me there's any moral equivalency in those? To me, I, I, I think we have primaries, so we have to have arguments like that. Because here's what I said on NPR earlier this morning about this very story. By the way, I do believe Steve Dace does <laughs> – he has now broken a new record. Uh, he may be the only political talk show host, pundit, uh, whoever, to appear both on NPR – and AFR on the same day. That, that is true. That's a pretty impressive thing. And, and, and said basically all the exact same things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to imagine, though, it's your wife, and, and she's in labor, and it's a crisis pregnancy, and you're on the most populated bridge on planet Earth. Right. And Chris Christie's buddies, they're actually, we find out they're standing outside laughing. They're enjoying it. They're getting a good look at it. They're sending snarky tweets, snarky emails back and forth. Imagine it's your dad. You know, he had a heart attack on the job and he's sitting in the back of an ambulance and they can't get to where they want to go because they shut down the George Washington Bridge to one lane. Which, to be clear, we don't know that anything like that did happen. No, but that's the point. It could have. It could have. And and whether he knew about it or not, to me, Chris Christie's not a hero. Comparing Chris Christie and Hillary Clinton, if you look at their records, Christie's judicial appointments, a lot of other things, the reality is Chris Christie is a Democrat. Fairly moderate Democrat, likable, moderate, boisterous Democrat, liberal, not really a leftist, but he's not a Republican. He's really a Democrat. And yeah, you want a huge election in New Jersey. Republicans had one net gain seat down ballot in the same election. He had no coattails. In fact, he went out and actively worked against the Republican Senate leader trying to win the Republican majority. And he went out and actually worked for three Democrat candidates uh, instead and endorsed them so the Republicans couldn't even get the majority of the legislature in his own state. Mm. All right. So but so I think, you know, we can walk and chew gum the same time as Christians. So I think we can clearly point out what you just mentioned, the sheer hypocrisy of the media. All right, where we left a diplomat to die, three other Americans to die, and then we joked to their family members uh, about uh, the, you know, we made sordid jokes like Biden did to their family members while they're mourning, still haven't given them justice, lied to the American people about it for well over a year, put a, tr- basically put a guy in prison and, and made him out to be some patsy fall guy because it was some video that he made and we all knew it, and they all knew it was a lie from the beginning. We can clearly point out the hypocrisy of the media here, but to me that doesn't absolve Chris Christie, Kevin, because... Just imagine how, what the, how, the recklessness of that decision and the fact, and, and I want to make sure our, our audience understands, the genesis of this entire story is that the Republican governor of New Jersey, who was going to win by double digits, no matter what, right. was upset that the Democrat mayor of a city wouldn't endorse him. 
And his staff, that's what caused his staff to do this. When you say for sure, sheer, petty, trivial politics like that, I'm going to put that many potential lives in danger. Whether you know about it or not, if you have underlings working for you that believe the people that you, know, you and I have staffs, the people that work for us. Do we create atmospheres that, that would make them think they could be that reckless? That that could ever be yes, okay. Yes, no, yeah. no, no way. So what does it say about that? And one of these guys that he had to force to resign, everybody knew was going to run his presidential campaign. Now they're talking about these guys might go to prison. So you can't have people in leadership yeah. positions that empower people underneath them when they take the sheer joy in a reckless decision that might have blessedly cost a lot of lives, and it didn't, but it certainly could have. Right. Uh, 888-589-8840. Some of you want to weigh in. Uh, Steve Dace joining Kevin McCullough at the AFA Today News Table. Let's talk to uh, Everett calling from Mississippi first. Hi, Everett. Welcome. You're on with uh, Steve Dace and Kevin McCullough. Oh, uh, yeah, Kevin, Steve, good to be on with you guys today. You too. Um, I just had something to say. You know, we got this re- bipartisan report out about Benghazi, and I'm one of these people, you know, I'm kind of a, I listen to both sides. I'm obviously a extremely, I- I'm probably re- conservative enough to make Ronald Reagan look liberal. <laughs> but um, I have yet to hear anything at all whatsoever on any major media even about it. I don't think that people are even going to find out unless they listen to AFR. I mean, okay, Everett, uh, I appreciate the call. Uh, Unfortunately, that music means we're up against it. We'll come back. Uh, More of your calls ready to be taken at 888-589-8840. Kevin McCullough with Steve Dace at uh, AFA Today on AFR Talk. Stay with us.